Hey there, it's Jessica Honiger, founder of the socially conscious fashion brand Noonday Collection. And this is the Going Scared podcast where we cover all things social impact, entrepreneurship, and courage. Today I'm sitting down with Belina Hertz. Her most recent book, Mindful Silence, has been saving my life lately. It's called The Heart of Christian Contemplation, and it's filled with insights and wisdom from her own experience, and she introduces us to themes and teachers of contemplative spirituality, as well as several other prayer practices and invites us to greater healing and wholeness by learning to practice faith through prayer. And I know... The kids are getting back in school and life is picking back up again. Those summer rhythms are becoming more routine. And I would just invite you to have contemplation and mindful silence be a part of your fall rhythms. I have found that contemplation is what grounds me. Getting alone and silent at the beginning of each of my days and not having any other expectations than just quieting my soul is absolutely what is fueling me and is what gives me um, energy and love in order to get me through the day. I love Felina because she has such a heart for social justice. She led for 20 years at Word Made Flesh. They work in more than 70 countries building community among victims of human trafficking, survivors of HIV and AIDS, abandoned children, and child soldiers and war brides. And then she and her husband, Chris, who is an Enneagram expert, they are co-founders together of the Gravity Center. You're going to hear all about that in today's conversation. So just listen to it with an open heart, with an open mind. And I would love to know what you are going to do in response to this conversation in particular. Okay, so I have to tell our listeners how this came to be because I love this story and here's why. We are going to be talking about mindful practices today, about contemplation, about things that I often don't associate with Instagram, okay? <laughs> like, I do not associate, like, consciousness and mindful and meditation. So a friend of mine recommended your book to me months ago, and I'm like a book junkie. So you recommend a book to me, and it immediately goes in Amazon Prime. And it had just been sitting on my bookshelf for months. And we were getting ready to move out of our master bedroom and into the Airstream. And I had to edit, 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 edit down my books. And I saw your book again and I thought, I'm going to just take this with me into the Airstream. It's going to be the one, one of the ones that I keep. Fast forward a few months later and I am sitting in my Airstream really in a time of um, coming off of nine years of adrenaline. (laughs) You know, like life has been supercharged, starting a company, scaling a company, working in vulnerable areas of the world, motivating and inspiring people here in America to care. And I'm realizing I've got just more growth to do. And I have a long history with contemplation. I actually, my whole spiritual journey sort of was, um, I was awakened in Washington, D.C. by a church called Church of the Savior, which um, was one of the first to kind of marry, um, well, I mean, if we're not talking Francis of Assisi first, but perhaps Mm -hmm. first in America to marry social action with contemplation. So I have this history, but then I I always pull away from the practices and then have to be brought back again and then have to be brought back again and have to be brought back again. So I'm sitting in one of those moments where I'm getting brought back again and I'm like, oh my God, that book, that book. And so I pick it up. I opened up, just randomly opened it up, which is what I do because I'm a seven on the Enneagram and I'm just like, just Mm -hmm. give give me a little parcel, give me a little bite. Mm. And I open up to exactly what I'm needing to hear because God has me in this journey of, of becoming unattached and untangled from outcomes. I open up to this page and I immediately posted on Instagram and mm-hmm. I'm thinking, I mean, I don't even know who this person is. I, mm-hmm. I didn't even think about tagging you. I'm like, people like this don't exist on the internet. They are off <laughs> in a faraway hut somewhere <laughs> in a Straw Bay Hill hut and they are not attached to anything that has to do with, with anything modern, like she's removed. <laughs> And then I get this DM and it's from you. And it's like, yeah. oh my gosh, you're reading my book. And I can't tell you in that moment how much credibility I received because uh. I thought, 
she's on the internet. She's <laughs> she's living this contemplative life and she's still on the internet. And that's what got me excited oh, to talk with you today because that. I think most people, most of my listeners, you know, listen, they are dedicating we we are probably dedicating obviously a lot less time than we should to mindful silence and certainly maybe a lot of listeners today don't even know what what we might be talking about and that's what I, where we're going to kind of start with the 101 but i just i appreciate that you are a normal person but choosing practices that are transformative so mm-hmm. excited to chat with you and b- well, but before we dive in before we yeah. dive in i did Wanted to know a little bit about where you came from and what brought you to this place because I gave the bio before you came on, but um, this idea of deep mindfulness is now a part of not just your own life, but of what you're wanting others to come along this pilgrimage with you. So tell me your journey to get here. Sure. Okay. I'll do my best. Uh, thanks for all of that. I'm so happy to know about how this came about and um, it's wonderful to get connected with you and I just love your work and respect what you're doing in the world. So thank you for that. And I think there's a, a connection point, a common ground here for us in terms of our work in the world. So um, yes. after university, you know, I ended up getting involved with an international nonprofit that was working with, at that point, this was in the mid nineties, we were working in South India with children with HIV and AIDS. And at that time, the disease was um, really scary. Like we still didn't know a lot about how it was contracted and there was a lot of fear around, around all of that. So in India, um, little babies were, were abandoned on roadsides and in hospitals and at beaches, um, because their parents had the stigma of AIDS and, and there was no one that wanted to like, you know, care for these little babies. So my husband, um, we weren't yet married, but he had, um, he was a few years ahead of me and he started the first pediatric AIDS care in Chennai, South India. And so once I graduated university, I got involved with this international nonprofit. My husband and I were married and we, um, our life just took off. So the organization grew from just a few of us doing that work in South India to about 300 of us working in 13 cities around, around in the majority world. So we were working with, um, in addition to the children and with HIV and AIDS, we were working with children living on the streets and abandoned widows and uh, children of war. So war brides and child soldiers. And in about a period of eight years, I can understand what you were saying about kind of running on adrenaline and not catching up with us. Um, that happened to me. And I was in Freetown, Sierra Leone at the peak of the war over blood diamonds. And I uh, had a huge crisis of faith and just began questioning everything about my world, my worldview, um, my sense of reality and, um, questioning, you know, what it was that I was trying to do in the world and does it even matter? And big questions, you know, around like, if God is good, why is there suffering? And, uh, and I can really relate to what you're saying about struggling with outcomes because it's like, Mm. here I was, you know, trying to make the world a better place. And, feeling like it's not really getting any better. Uh, So after that, I um, came back to the States and uh, my work was very itinerant. Like we were establishing these communities all over the world. So we would jet across the globe multiple times a year, visiting our communities, trying to address um, some of the most horrific um, issues related to human suffering. And so I came back to the U.S. and was trying to process uh, human brutality that I witnessed in Sierra Leone at a scale that I'd never seen before. And my friend asked me, uh, after listening to all the stories, like, do you ever doubt the goodness of God? And I just broke down and wept. And, you know, you have to understand, I grew up in a religious home. My father was a pastor. I took my, my spirituality very seriously from a young age and had a sense of, you know, my life had me purpose but in those moments, it was like everything came crashing down. It was huge deconstruction of my sense of self and, and reality. And so not long after that, I met, uh, I guess it was about two years. I mean, I, I actually was in a really dark night for mm. two years, which means that like not only was I questioning my spiritual upbringing and perspective, but I was um, dealing with psychological deconstruction too. Uh, mm-hmm. and I was in therapy and 
just going through darkness. And were you still at this time running the organization or how? <laughs> yes. I mean, that's, that's what's so challenging, right? Because we oh, can, yeah. you know, you can't just yeah. suddenly be like, oh, I built this organization for nine yeah. years and yeah. I'm having a breakdown. So yeah. I'll be back in a few months. <laughs> yeah. And all the while, like you can relate, all these people around the world are dependent on, you know, you doing well and continuing the flow of you know, the work so that they can feed their children. So how did you walk in that tension during that time of holding both your work and your internal pilgrimage? Oh my gosh. It was so intense, Jessica. So intense. I mean, I, I don't know how I did it, to be honest. I, yeah. I mean, looking back, I, you know, you just do what you have to do. I think parents understand this. I'm not a parent, but you know, you just do what you have to do. And yeah. it was just putting one foot in front of the other taking care of business and doing my best to tend to my soul. And then it was meeting Father Thomas Keating after two years of this darkness that um, I was introduced to the Christian contemplative tradition in this practice called Centering Prayer, a meditation practice. And I had not been exposed to anything like that ever. And uh, and that changed my life, saved my life. Like, mm. finally, I had a practice to hold, um, to hold me in the tensions of my life and the way mm. things were falling apart inside. So really at that point, you know, that's how I did it. That's how I made it. That's how I was able to, you know, keep my responsibilities and tend to this, uh, this deconstruction of self. So what were some of the key awakening moments for you when you contrast this idea of centering prayer with what your prayer life had previously been. Yeah, for sure. Yeah. And I love what you're saying. So, um, you know, what I came to realize at that point of breaking was, uh, yeah, I couldn't pray anymore. Like I couldn't read scripture. I couldn't go to church, like nothing, all the practices that had sustained me up to that point, like spiritual practices were falling short. Like they weren't helping anymore. They weren't connecting to the real world that I had come to know and love. And, uh, and so all of that just was seemed really not helpful at all. And so there I was like really struggling, like, where do I go from here? And my faith community really unequipped to, um, or ill-equipped to support me at that point. And, and it was, I mean, you know, there's this wisdom saying that when the student is ready, the teacher will appear. And, uh, and that's what happened with Thomas Keating for me. And so I had this guy that was like helping me realize that there's an onward journey and the practices that, that fall short. Um, like that's a part of the spiritual journey that that's actually okay, that we don't have to despair over that. So then coming into, um, contemplative practice, contemplation, meditation, what I found was that the ways I was praying before, um, in a lot of ways, um, was me still being in control. And mm. that now I had a practice that helped me let go of control and move into a deep place of trust. And honestly, the practices before that point like couldn't, couldn't help me acquire that, that depth of trust. So that was um, a big awakening, I guess, you know, of realizing. I needed practices that could actually hold me. Um, I needed to be held. I needed to be um, grounded. I needed I needed practices that like where I could really let go and and let love do its work in me in a transcendent mm-hmm. way, so that my love in the world would be more like flowing from that that source, if you will. I mean, mm-hmm. I know this can sound a little maybe esoteric to people, but if we think about our life, you know, how much of our effort to love is draining us. And, um, you know, in the Christian faith, uh, Jesus's sayings is that my yoke is easy and my burden is light. And it's like, that's not what I was experiencing at all, Mm -hmm. you know, beforehand. And so now I was starting to move into a spiritual space in my life that helped me flow more, I think, with this easy and light way of being in really desperate, horrible, challenging circumstances. Mm. You know, another awakening that I'm thinking of is when I came to realize that social justice and activism addresses toxicity in the world. 
but contemplation addresses it in ourself. Mm. And, and so what I've come to really appreciate over the years of like now, gosh, probably 15 years of um, serious meditation is that um, what's happening in the world is a reflection what's ha- of what's happening in, happening inside of us, like collectively. And that and if we don't address um, our inner self and um, the illusions of self and how we project so much of that on the world, unless we're doing that work, um, our work externally in the world will be limited in terms of its effectiveness. Uh, so the two have to go hand. It's really like switching full fuel tanks. Mm-hmm. Um, my my dad, he was a Vietnam War vet, and he kept up with his pilot license. So he's had a little Cessna over the years. And my mom sent me this video recently with a text message that said "almost died." And my they were flying up into the air. They were flying from Texas to New Mexico, and my mom's filming the takeoff. It was like the perfect flight conditions, beautiful day, and she kind of like, you know, moves her iPhone to the right wing of the plane and there's something coming out of the right wing, but she's like, oh, my husband knows exactly what he's doing. I'm not even going to let him know. Well, ends up it was the fuel gauge, like the fuel was leaking all over Texas because my dad had not screwed the gas cap <gasps> on. <laughs> oh my gosh. He had not screwed the gas cap on, but I guess in flying, you huh. switch from the left wing, the, there's, the, there's a fuel tank on the left wing and then there's a fuel tank on the right wing. And so when he switched to the right wing for the fuel tank, the plane would just start to coast because there was no fuel. Oh, my gosh. So they had enough fuel in the left wing of the plane to emergency land and they were safe, blah, blah, blah. But I I often think it's like, um, you know, we can operate from this one fuel tank. But if the fuel tank is like hustle and striving and performance or getting our needs met by meeting other people's needs or whatever Mm -hmm. it is, that is going to run out. And Mm. then we've got to switch. We've got to switch to another tank. But there's that moment of coasting in between where you're like, the wheels are off the bus. Mm -hmm. You know, like Mm -hmm. we're coasting. Am I going to land? Am Mm. I still going to be able to fly? And then, but you've got to be able to like be fueled by that other wing, you know, Mm. but the, the new fuel is something that is sustainable and will get us through. And it's interesting to think about how our posture in prayer can even come from a controlling place. And Mm -hmm. that will absolutely like that will drain us. Mm -hmm. And so I'm curious to know um, what is your crash course uh, to use, Mm -hmm. (laughs) to use this uh, plain terminology on a contemplative spirituality? Oh man, gosh, I love your metaphor. You know, the 101, the two minute version here. (laughs) Yeah. yeah. Um, Gosh, where, where, where should I begin with? Um, just a few minutes. I mean, what I'd love to say is like, come to my retreats, you know, <laughs> we'll get into it. Yeah, we need well, a weekend. Yeah, well, tell us about that. No, yeah. no, no. Tell us about that because yeah. I, um, yeah, I'm so curious to know yeah. um, about now this is a part of what you're wanting to teach in the world. Yeah, that's right. So just so listeners can kind of track with me chronologically, uh, I continue to run, co-lead with my husband, that international nonprofit for another I guess, 10 years or so. And then uh, in 2012. So you had this moment with, yeah. with Thomas Keating, not just a moment, but then you, yeah. you become introduced to this new way yes. of interacting with God and yourself and your attachments and your egos and all of these mm-hmm. things. Mm-hmm. And you start getting fueled mm-hmm. by a new source. Mm-hmm. And then you continue to run this nonprofit, but in a way that where you did ultimately were able to wear a lighter burden. Would yes. you say that's true? Yes, for sure. Mm-hmm. Yep. And we started to try to integrate um, contemplation with that community, but people weren't really in in the most part, for the most part, they weren't really uh, ready for it. It wasn't really sticking. There was still, I think think that we need like to live a certain amount of life to get to the place where we do kind of crash and burn to realize what we need. I mean, hopefully, Uh you know, we can, I mean, there may be another way to do it. And I'm, I'm hopeful that um, and the trajectory of the evolution of consciousness and where we're at today as a society, um, really va- beginning to value c- contemplation and meditation more, that there's another way to do it. But for most of us, it takes time to get to a place where we really appreciate the need for contemplation in our life. So all that to say, by 2012, 
my husband and I decided to devote ourselves full time to the integration of contemplation and action by starting a new nonprofit called Gravity. And so that's what I've been doing for the last seven years. And, uh, and so at Gravity, we focus on spiritual direction, contemplative retreats, and Enneagram consultations and workshops. And so we host three retreats a year. Yeah, three retreats a year here in the Omaha area. And then uh, I'm co- contracted out to various communities around the world to, to give these retreats. But for these weekend retreats, um, we offer different stages of introduction to contemplative practice. And the, the one we do in the fall is called the Grounding Retreat. And we gather people together from all over the country. They come to Omaha, Nebraska, in the center of, of the U.S. And, um, We go out to a little Benedictine monastery and we spend the weekend together and I offer teaching around what is contemplation and all that. And then we practice various contemplative practices together and we debrief those and we, um, we help people figure out how this can be integrated into their life. So, I mean, for listeners today, you know, it's basically about making time for some degree of solitude, silence, and stillness. And, and this, this version of contemplation really comes from the monastic tradition in the Christian lineage. So it is very much around practices of solitude, silence, and stillness, but that's not to say that there aren't other ways to enter into contemplation, but this is just the um, lineage from which I teach, which is similar to um, Buddhist, a lot of Buddhist and Hindu practices as well that focus on some degree of solitude, silence, and stillness. So in solitude, as we cultivate more solitude, you know, withdrawing for a time from the rat race and the intensity and the drivenness, uh, and we we take some time to be relatively alone, um, we actually develop um, this capacity to be more present to ourselves, to our people, the world that we live in, and um, whatever notions of God we we have to be more present. This is the gift of solitude. And then um, in silence, we cultivate this capacity to listen, to listen to ourselves, to listen to one another, uh, to listen to God. And then in stillness, we cultivate this capacity to, um, for really, for restraint. So see, so much of our action in the world. I think Parker Palmer mentions it like this, like so much of our action in the world is reaction. And so Mm -hmm. we're, you know, we're operating with a lot of reactivity in the world. My reactivity is hitting your reactivity and we're doing the best we can. But if we can uh, pause and withdraw for periods of time, you know, if it's a few minutes a day, if it's uh, longer periods at different seasons in in the year, uh, then we can uh, deal with this reactivity that gets addressed and we uh, emerge from these practices with a little more capacity to respond to life rather than react. And, and this is, this is where the real work gets done in the world. We find a way I think to respond to what's going on rather than react out of our own deficits, our own needs, our own illusions, um, that sort of thing. So contemplation begins to free us up from, ultimately who we thought we were and, and, and plants us in a, in a more um, rooted identity of being um, really divine humans that are, that have access to so much more resource to um, be co-creators in the world, to, to be agents of creativity and healing. And, and so we need, you know, we need ways to access that essence. I think contemplation helps us do that. It's interesting because, you know, I wrote a book called Imperfect Courage Mm -hmm. and the end of your book, really, you kind of summarize everything as being about, you know, being brave and being courageous. Mm -hmm. And let's talk a little bit about the correlation between courage and contemplation. Wow. Courage and contemplation. Yeah. So, okay. We're just going to, we're going to get real now. Okay. (laughs) Let's do it. Okay. So when I uh, found myself kind of deconstructing and rethinking and reimagining everything, who I am, um, the nature of reality, uh, I was confronted with um, this personality structure <clears throat> for myself, which the Enneagram really helps illuminate. So if 
those of your listeners who are aware of the Enneagram, there's nine types. And I'm, I identify with type two, the need to be needed is another way of knowing um, or understanding the type two. So I start, so this is what I mean when like contemplation helps us begin to uncover our illusions. So I was just operating in the world as Felina. I never gave it another thought. I was just doing my thing. But part of the reason why I burned out and um, had that, that dramatic crisis was because I was operating out of this personality that said, or was driven by um, what other people, what I thought other people wanted or needed from me and, um, and being driven by their approval of me and their acceptance of me. So I was like, when I woke up to that, I realized how much of my life had been driven by that. And it was um, devastating to me because it was killing me ultimately. And it wasn't who I really was. So I, I woke up to that. And then it's like, well, now what? Now what am I going to? And who the hell am I? If that's not who I really am, who am I? And how can I be more free, you know, to not be so um, enslaved to other people's opinions of me, that sort of thing. So I'm dealing with all of that. And, uh, and I begin to access this possibility that there's something like there's another me inside. Like I, I kind of refer to that, that other version as like false Felina, not the true Felina, but then it's like, that's the only Felina I ever knew. So through contemplation, then see, I had this opportunity to let go of that personality structure. And that takes enormous courage. I mean, because it's like, you don't know who you're going to be once you let go of that. And, mm. and I was wrestling with that internally. And, uh, and it was very much like a walking off the cliff. It was a free fall. And it was like, I had no guarantees that I wouldn't just crash at the bottom of the fall, you know, and there'd be nothing left of me. And, uh, and so, yeah, the courage came through the practices of just this continual, um, it's like this embodied practice of letting go and trusting, trusting beyond any kind of trust we've ever exercised before. And then um, it's very much the process of like um, the caterpillar and going into the cocoon and not knowing, you know, how, what will be on the other side of it. And uh, in my first book, I, I mentioned this story that I heard on NPR and these scientists study these butterflies and they put these little microphones up on the chrysalis um, while the caterpillar was in there, you know, being transformed. And what they found was that um, the caterpillar cried out in agony. Like it's a really difficult process. So this is why um, uh, contemplation is not too popular on Instagram because it's just like, <laughs> It's, it's like, you know, I, I can't, I can't sell this stuff. Like, it's like you know, all your listeners are like, okay, I'm done. I don't want this, you know, but those of you who have like woken up to the reality that like the way you're functioning in the world isn't working very well for you. Like those are the people who are ready for contemplation. Those are the people who are ready to get real. It's like the matrix. I mean, I just, I love that movie so much. It's really mm -hmm. like, you know, which pill are you going to take? Are you going to keep living in blissful ignorance? Or are you going to wake up to the truth of who you are, your, your divine humanity with these resources for incredible um, co-creative work in the world that really brings so much more meaning to, to your life? You know, that's what contemplation really offers. Well, and I think so many people relate to being burnt out and being like, oh my gosh, you know, life, I'm being pulled in all these different directions and life is so crazy. And, you know, because we do live out of these places of people pleasing. I mean, for me, I'm a seven on the Enneagram. So my kind of way of helping others came from, has come from something else, which I think actually getting to know the Enneagram made me see, like, I am so, um, I just hate pain so much that I, it's like, it makes me so uncomfortable when other people are, are in pain. <laughs> so mm -hmm. I feel like a lot of my motivation in wanting to create possibility it, for the poor has been because I just like, I can't stand you being in pain. So I have to get you out of that place. Mm -hmm. And what would stop me from contemplation is this idea, the false belief 
um, which I write about in Imperfect Courage, that this lie that I'm all alone in the world and no one is going to come to rescue me. And so choosing aloneness, that feels so scary yes. when you already have this back narrative of like, but you are all alone and you're going to get all alone. And when you get alone, you're just going to feel more alone. Yeah. So let's just keep going so we don't feel That's alone right. in the world, That's you know? Right. Yeah. And, I, and I think we all have these these different things, but then when we can actually do the bravest thing we can do, which is just stop and feel our feelings um, and then just untangle all of these egos. I, I've been like naming my little egos lately. Oh. <laughs> it's been helpful. I've, I've had this one ego and she was like, I want what I want and I'll get what I want when I want it. Wow. Okay. I don't know how much more seven on the Enneagram you can yes. get than that, but I was feeling discouraged be- about um, some intentions I had towards the business and where Noonday was going to be and everything I do, I want it to be big and more and there's always more. And I'm always wanting more. I mean, that is sort of the nat- my natural state of being is like, I want more. Mm-hmm. I want more. And it was when I was in this place, um, and it was the day I read your book where I'd really hit a low, and I kind of called an emergency session with my executive coach, who I had not seen in a few months, which might explain also where I, why I got to this mm-hmm. place. And I was just explaining, like, I feel like, you know, I'm on a diet, not losing weight. Like, we've done this, we've done this, we've done this, and I'm just, I'm frustrated. And that's when she just was like, you were holding on so tightly to outcomes. And she said this to me, and this is what has transformed my life in the last two months. She said, I want to give you permission to spend the next few days not wanting. Oh. <laughs> oh that was- and I was like, that's an option? I mean, I'm like the visionary. I'm the passionate. I'm the one who's getting everyone to like, I am breathing the wind and everyone sails. Like, let's go. And I thought that I, I could I could just not want. How was that for you? Liberating. I'm still trying to find my way, though. I feel like I'm in between fuel tanks right now. Mm-hmm. If we're going to go back to the airplane analogy, because wanting has always fueled me. You know, like wanting more, and of course, the more is always constantly justified because I'm wanting more people to have dignified jobs so they won't go work in brothels when they're 10 years old. And I'm wanting more women to be able to have economic empowerment in India so that they're treated like humans and not like cattle, you know? So, um, I I'm, I'm like, okay, I'm just trying to find my way now that I'm not being fueled by this perpetual need to want. And so it's definitely brought this stillness and my mantra the last couple of months has been, I don't want anything more than the moment that I have right now. Mm -hmm. And I love that about contemplation because I think people think contemplation and you do think a lot about like remembrance or kind of processing. And um, towards the end of your book, you talk about one of your times at a hermitage. And I love this. You say, I found the grace of being present to be so profound that I had very few reflective moments. And I think that's the power of contemplation is that it's not like, I think so many of us, we want to go in with like, um, you know, here's our list of questions we're going to ask ourselves, you know, like our executive meetings are like, start, stop, keep. What are you going to start doing? What are you going to stop doing? What are you going to keep doing? And that's not what contemplation is. Contemplation is waking up to the very moment you have right now, the present, which is basically all you have. Like you're only always in the present. That's right. And I am. 100,000% future oriented. And, you know, I use it as a huge escape, place of escape for me. And so for me, I've lived under this false belief that that there is a point of arrival, you know, that there is. And so that was another, I mean, I I had so many things come breaking down a couple months ago in that moment with my executive coach. It was awesome. Um, So it was, yeah, it was like, don't want anything more than what you have right now. And then I said, I believe there's this point of arrival that like if I can reach this amount of success that suddenly then I'm not going to feel like as responsible or as stressed or um, as driven or whatever. And so I'm like, you know, trying, I'm operating out of like getting to that place. And Mm. she's like, yeah, 
Yeah, there's there's no point. There's no point of arrival. That's right. There's no point of arrival out there. It's the stopping and finding that you've already arrived. That is the gift. So what would you say to the person that's listening right now and they're like, I relate. I relate to the believing that there's a point of arrival. I relate to serving the world out of this uh, need to be needed. Or maybe they relate to me that like, oh my gosh, if I get alone, I'm going to just feel more alone. And let's say they get off this podcast, like what are just like a couple little, like take them by the hand and maybe they're listening to this in the morning um, on their way to carpool drop off or on their way home. How could they spend 10 minutes today differently like give them a taste aside from of course coming to your retreats but what what like what's the what could the next few days look like for them well i mean some of the most practical things folks can do on the go is uh is return to the now like so if you're if you're driving and you're coming to a traffic light like how many of us can just like be quiet and still even for moments at a traffic stop or in the line at the grocery store, or whatever it is when there are those down moments, like it's so hard for any of us to just be present to that. Like we have to get on our phone, we have to scroll through whatever, you know, I mean, there's some really serious sicknesses going on now with um, our addictions, you know, digital addictions, and this is a real thing in the brain. So another reason why I think people are realizing um, the need for contemplation and meditation, because we're living in this kind of digital, digitally addicted age that's just killing us. So just taking those, like being mindful of those opportunities when everything stops and you have a moment to just be and let yourself be and notice your breath and um, being just attentive to um, taking a few deep belly breaths, you know, this three-part yogic breath from the belly through the chest and head, like noticing breath is a great way to begin to cultivate presence. So finding those moments when everything stops and your first like first impulse is to grab the phone and scroll through whatever you want to look at, like just resist that for a few minutes, you know, or if it's turning on the music and the car or whatever, like maybe it's just getting quiet, just letting yourself be there for a minute. Those are really easy, practical things that we can do just to become a little more mindful of the present moment. And then I'm thinking about um, an Insight Timer app. It's um, the world's largest meditation app called Insight Timer, and it's free. And there are so many different teachers and uh, guided meditations, and you can sort them by the minutes that you have. Uh, and I would just recommend everybody get that and explore it and just take some time to, you know, a lot of folks like feel intimidated to just stop everything and like go into a silent meditation, like especially if they've never had um, a teaching or um, instruction on it. So use the insight timer and find some guided meditations that appeal to you. They, there's uh, meditations from all different faith traditions on there. And, um, and that's a great little support for folks. Well, and your book, Mindful Silence, is so helpful in that way is that it does really give practical ways to enter into this. And it's another thing I deeply appreciated about um, about your book is there's there's like a certain pragmatism behind it, which I think is really helpful mm-hmm. for people. You get kind of kind of to the concrete ways to practice this so it doesn't remain so esoteric. Mm-hmm. Um, so Felina's book, Mindful Silence, The Heart of Christian Contemplation, I would highly recommend it. Well, we always ask our guests at the end how they are going scared. And I'm assuming that even though you are awoken, awake, fully awake, and you spend now, I don't even want to know how many (laughs) silent weekends you might spend (laughs) in your your year, Mm. but you probably still have some fears. So how Mm. are you going scared right now? Mm. I love this question. It is so hard to be human, you know? Um, no matter how much I am committed to spiritual practice, I have seasons of life that uh, require enormous courage to be present to my life in a really authentic way. So not in a way that's like defaulting to my personality structure that wants to please everybody, but um, responding to life from authenticity. 
what I know to be true and most real and most right. And what I found is that when I when I function from that place of essence, truth within me, as terrifying as it is, because ultimately I risk being rejected, right? But as terrifying as that is, um, it ends up being a gift to everyone else in my life, um, even if they don't like it <laughs> in the beginning. So um, I'm confronting my fears and my courage, I would say, almost on a daily basis. Uh, mm. And it is a conscious choice to choose courage, which is connected to most authentic self. Uh, and I have the option to do that or not, you know. Thanks for tuning in to my extremely Enneagram 7 podcast where we cover everything from meditation to having people like the founder of the dry bar ali webb on or we have the publisher of forbes on that's what i love about these conversations Um, i love bringing in a diversity of people and introducing you to some practices that are going to be helpful on your journey towards courage I would love to hear how this podcast in particular is transforming you. I would love for you to go practice some of those things that Felina suggested and then DM me on Instagram. Y'all know I'm, I'm on Insta. I try to get back to everyone who writes in and I'd love to hear about your journey of contemplation as well. So find me at Jessica Honiger. That is two G's and one N. Thanks so much for tuning in to today's show. Our wonderful music is by my good friend, Ellie Holcomb. Going Scared is produced by Eddie Kohlholtz. And I'm Jessica Honiger. Until next time, let's take each other by the hand and keep going scared. <laughs>